Welcome to the Sheboygan County Historical Society and Museum for another Third Saturday program. Welcome. My name is Bob Harker, the director of the Sheboygan County Historical Museum, and today the Third Saturday program is all about radio history and radio personalities from Sheboygan County. You're going to be meeting lots of folks. You're also going to be seeing a collection of very old radios made in Wisconsin as well as part of our day to day. So enjoy the day. It's Third Saturday. Radio History and Radio Personalities of Sheboygan County. Uh, my name is Adam Smith and I'm an intern here at the Sheboygan County Historical Society and I put this uh, teaser exhibit together as a highlight for um, the Radio and Radio Personalities uh, Third Saturday program that the museum is putting on today. Um, this instrument here is one of the first broadcasting uh, equipment here in uh, Sheboygan County. It was at the WHBL radio station um, and it was one of their uh, first transmitters that they had uh, there at the station. And uh, you can see how um, radio uh, transmitting equipment's definitely changed a lot uh, over the years. This is a fairly um, large piece of equipment and now uh, it's, they're a lot smaller today. Um, we also put together a large number of different radios that we had uh, here in the museum's collections to kind of highlight how radios have changed um, over time. Uh, we have some of the uh, smaller radios um, such as a uh, transportable um, uh, radio that they uh, could have taken to like the beach or um, to other areas of town. Um, and we also took one of the radios in Atwater, Kent that we uh, <coughs> could take the cover off to show what some of the equipment inside of the radio uh, looks like. Um, so you can see how uh, it's made up of bulbs and all the different wiring in there as well. Um, and we also have uh, a large Philco radio um, that, we, that is in the collection to show how um, the size of some of the early radios and how they would have fit into um, a person's living room, how they would have served um, as some of the decorative um, elements in uh, a person's house or home. And then we also have another smaller Philco radio um, that would have just um, showed how it sh uh, the size of those radios uh, changed over time as well. Okay, my name is Greg Hinold. I live in uh, Plymouth, Wisconsin, and I've been a collector of antique radios since uh, around 1993 or so. Uh, I got into it because I've always had an interest in radios and always kind of liked the old radios that my grandparents had that I played with as a kid. And then later on, I got, as, as I got a chance, I began to, to find them in stores and then buy one or two. And I originally bought radios from all different times, but I really became interested in the early 1920s, which is what my collection now focuses on, because not only did I find the radios very interesting, but it was a very interesting time, because the onset of radio and, and, the, and the proliferation of radio in the American public just completely transformed the way people lived. Uh, a medium of mass communication, there's nothing like it before. It's similar to the transformation that the internet has, has uh, wrought since. But uh, so it's the radios and the context of their times that is what uh, is really most interesting to me. So these radios that I brought for today, on the left are examples of early crystal sets. Uh, crystal sets use a tiny crystal as a detector and, and before originally before vacuum tubes were used and then even after vacuum tubes were used because they were very inexpensive because they didn't require any power and they worked all the time. These are examples of uh, vacuum tubes that were used in radios of the, in the period 1921-1926. Nowadays in the computer there will be millions of transistors on a chip and each one of them you could think of as being like one of these tubes. And these were the batteries used to power the old battery sets as most of the radios, of course, before electrification, were all, they were all battery powered except for the crystal sets that didn't need any power. Most people made their own radios in the early 1920s. There were some for sale, some that were fairly expensive, and a lot of people found it more economical to just buy, build their own radios, and this is an example of a home-built radio and the sort of books that people would uh, buy to get instructions on how to do it. The first radio that was made for home use was the radio, uh, or the Westinghouse RCA Model RC, or the Radiola RC, as it came to be known, as um, RCA was marketing them for Westinghouse, part of the Radio Corporation of America. But this was the first radio that was actually made for home use. 
I wanted to feature uh, Wisconsin-made radios. And the first of these is the Western Quad Electric Model WC-10, which was made in 1923 down in Racine, Wisconsin. Western Coil was in radio for a long time and made very high quality equipment. And this is a, you know, an example of one of their products. And to the right of that are th examples of three speakers. All the radios that you see here, except for the very last one, used external speakers. And they were originally horn speakers, such as this Atwater Ken horn. And, and this is actually another type of horn speaker in front, and then cone speakers like this uh, Crosley uh, Ultra Music Cone. The sound of these was by, you know, it's comparably weak in the bay high range uh, treble and bass, but pretty well, pretty good in the mid range. And the better ones of these reproduce music pretty respectably given the limitations of the technology of the time. On the left is uh, Crosley Pup, small radio, small cubicle radio with a tube sticking out of the top. This was sold in the 20s, 1925, 26, as a very inexpensive, popular uh, sort of starter radio for people, but it actually worked quite well. Paul Crosley was uh, the owner of the company in Cincinnati, Ohio, sold Crosley cars, Crosley refrigerators, and a whole variety of other Crosley products. The next radio is the Globe Model 770. The Globe Electric Company in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, was a big producer of radios for a period of time in the 20s, from around 1922 to 1926 or so. This is an example of one of their sets. And the next one is a Wells radio, Wells from Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, who were in radio from uh, 1922 to again to around 1926. An example of, of one of theirs. And the final Wisconsin radio is the Empire Model 5 that was made in Beaver Dam, Wisconsin. Many towns, including Plymouth and, and I'm sure Sheboygan, had small companies making radios as, as uh, companies were jumping into the market to take advantage of the, the great interest that was developing in radio. A lot of them didn't last um, as the bigger companies gradually, uh, through mass production, were able to kind of price them out. And then, of course, with the onset of the uh, Depression. And the final one is a Philco Model 70, which is a 1931 radio. It's a classic example of what's called the cathedral design, the design of the uh, cabinet. A lot of times when you uh, think of an antique radio or something so suggests what an antique radio was, it's a radio of this sort that they will uh, point to, a radio like the Philco Model 70. Okay, I'm Julian Yetzer, and I started in radio in the Sheboygan area back in 1958, uh, officially. Got into things about radio before that, but started in 1958, and off and on for 42 years. I spent a lot of time at uh, WHBL, also um, uh, worked at WKTS, uh, eventually bought WKTS, and then built a new radio station in Plymouth, Wisconsin, called WXER, an FM station there, and retired from radio in about 2000. So spent 42 years in the broadcast business here in the Sheboygan area and uh, loved every minute of it. And Steve wants to show you here a couple of things and on display. Um, there's some photos and things from the old WHBL years. We um, we had a party line program that was run on the station and it was normally run by a, a gentleman called Dick Rulo on the air. His name, his regular name was uh, Dick Helhake and uh, he would do uh, recipes and, and get recipes from callers and they would, uh, it was a very popular program. It was on every morning for several hours and a lot of, a lot of ladies would get involved. We also did some interviews uh, with a lot of people. Uh, the one you were just looking at was uh, an interview that we did for uh, photography in the area. Mark Eilis from Gene Sound and Camera appeared along with Frank Wright and myself, and that was back in uh, the 1950s, late 1950s, early 60s. Um, the Party Line program ended up with a number of recipe booklets, and that's a little picture of one of them. Also, all of our commercials back in the 1950s were played on what we called acetates. That was that black record you were just looking at. Uh, those are called acetates, and those were 
uh, cut by the engineer on duty after he would make the commercials on tape and then to play the commercials on the air we would play them like a record and if the commercial would run several times then we would have to make a number of tracks on that acetate because they would wear out very quickly so that's how we played commercials and right now that this is uh, some pictures of the WKTS studios those pictures there are, were taken of the studio when it was above the old Walgreens store on uh, 8th and Wisconsin Avenue. That would be uh, about 1977-1978. Uh, the studio was later moved to uh, to uh, Union Avenue and then after that, after the FM was built back in uh, 1990, the next pictures you see will be the studios that were built for that station uh, those pictures were taken at the WKTS and WXER studios that were in Sheboygan Falls, Wisconsin. And that was during the 1990s through about 2006. Let's go back in history a little bit. This goes back to the 1920s through the 1950s at WHBL and many stations across the country. They used chimes just like NBC did for many years to announce station breaks and also, also to announce uh, when the news was on, especially in Sheboygan here. The 12 noon news and the 6 p.m. daily news always started with these chimes and I'll play them for you. When people in the Sheboygan area heard those chimes, then they knew it was time for the news. And in my day, it was with Paul Skinner. When the news with Paul Skinner came on, that was like receiving the Sheboygan press for the day. Everyone got all of the local news. That was the only way you could get it. There was no cable television back then. I'm Jim Riesenberg. Back in the 60s, uh, uh, 67, 68, working at then WPLY uh, as Jim Rogers. I, I left the Navy in 1965, <clears throat> got a job in the post office for a little while, bushling up some money, and in 1966, January, I went to Brown Institute of Radio Broadcasting in, in Minneapolis. I stayed at Brown Institute. I finished my course of study at Brown Institute in June of, of 1967 and was waiting for a job placement in a station that specialized in country music. Eventually, uh, I think it was in October, the placement office called and said they had an opening at WPLY in Plymouth, a 500 watt peanut whistle type operation, sunrise to sunset. I said, I'll look into it. I drove over here on, in October, met with the station manager, Mr. Hilly, and the staff. Uh, I'll take the job, so that's where it happened. A lot of things have changed uh, since way back then. We had a, st a, a staff announcers, we had three, had a station manager, a general manager, and an engineer on call. Uh, I grew up uh, in listening to country music in my th five, four years in the Navy, three of those were in San Diego, and especially influenced by what we call West Coast country. There are three, at that time, probably three segments of country music, the hill style of Nashville, the shuffle uh, style, the western swing style of Texas, and the, the west coast sound. The Merle Haggards and the Buck Owens were just moving in. But I made it a point to know exactly what was going on in country music all the time. My mentor at that time was Eddie Briggs. And I found that uh, if, you know, if you know a little bit more, people honestly and truthfully believe that you're sincere in, in what you're talking about. So you can see from the, from the publications that are available here that I have in my personal collection, uh, they're really uh, the, the reason that I knew as much as I did and why I still continue to collect uh, the old country. In 1974, when the Grand Ole Opry left the Ryman Auditorium and moved into Opryland, uh, the station had a bus going down there. I still have my ticket stubs, the swatch of curtain from the old Ryman curtain and George Wallace's autograph on the program. Uh, a lot of things have changed in, in country music since, since back then, and I, it's probably understandable, uh, but I listen to country music today, and it isn't the, it's not the same as it was back then. The presentation is different today. 
uh, to me anyway, it's nothing more than rock and roll with, with cowboy boots and a, and a big white hat. But be that as it may, uh, time, times change and life goes on. And from a, from a management point of view, I suppose you either change and move on or get, uh, get caught up in the backwash and nothing else is going to happen and that's where you're going to sit. Would I get back into music today? If I could play what I played back then, you bet I would. It's not available in very many places anymore, especially on the radio dial. There are several, uh, I don't believe there are any live, there's very little live radio anywhere in, in any uh, uh, medium anymore. And those st stations that do play uh, the old country, you can find them on the push buttons on my car radio. But most of those are all syndicated shows, and they pretty much all follow the same format. <clears throat> and and, and, and uh, I have a collection. I have probably several hundred CDs and a couple of hundred of the old 33 and a third albums that uh, uh, are basically from, I think probably the newest one would be 1972. And, and you know, I guess beyond that, uh, I, I would like to see it come back, but I don't think it ever will. It, it music, uh, all gen generations of music go through uh, a specific cycle. And, <clears throat> and when, when Hank Williams died and the music changed, uh, Ray Price took over the band and managed to bring it back and, and keep that style of uh, type of music uh, alive and active. And, but it's, it's never going to be the same. If, if, you, if you see the shows today, uh, you don't hear too many. You don't hear Merle Haggard on the radio anymore on today's country stations. You're probably lucky. The oldest one you might hear would be Willie Nelson. And I don't know who he would team up with to get that on. But those are, those are the, the things that I remember. And those are the things that I like the best about the country music that we had way back then. Fortunately, a lot of it's been preserved. I've got uh, a couple of dozen reels as well, in addition to the CDs and the, and the uh, albums, but it's, it's probably uh, we're going to have to find a way to convert it to a disc or something because uh, there's no place to play records anymore. I'm Larry Barr from 1420 AM The Breeze. I've been at The Breeze probably for five or six years and uh, very happy to be there. Uh, we play American standards and the Great American Songbook and th things like uh, the Mills Brothers and Harry Belafonte, uh, Frank Sinatra, Tony Bennett, things like that. We've also got some, some oldies that fit in. It's just a very good station to listen to. It's very, uh, well, there's, nobody's going to object to it. It's very decent family programming. Uh, I used to... Well, actually, I started at a very young age in 1972 at WPLY, and I worked at every station in the county since, and a couple of stations out of the area like Indianapolis and Milwaukee. And uh, one of the things I just wanted to bring up that I think is kind of interesting is some of this. Originally, things started off being pretty much coming in on records. And if we had to record any commercials, this was a little before my time, but everything had to be recorded on a disc. Uh, from there, it went to tapes. And I'd say that transition happened probably in the late 60s. Missing something between cassettes kind of took over for just a few years, and then it was CDs. So we get a lot of things right now uh, with CDs. But lately, we're also getting a lot of things uh, through the internet and uh, digitally. So there's a lot that just comes in that way and this is almost gone by the wayside too. It used to be that somebody had to be at the station all the time, push all the buttons and hit all the switches. Commercials and some songs used to be recorded on these, which were used to their carts. It's just magnetic tapes, something like this, but just in a much more convenient form. Uh, this is an old ribbon microphone that used to be used at WPLY. Uh, just happened to have it here at, this, at WJUB. And this, uh, most stations are, have transmitters now that are solid state. However, this is a final tube. Uh, this happens to be from WHBL, but it's exactly the same kind that used to be in the transmitter at uh, WPLY. Uh, so things are much more dependable, don't need to be changed as often. Uh, that used to be 
to have to be changed like every nine to, to 12 months or so. My name is Bill Horsch. I currently serve as the general manager of 1420 AM The Breeze and 91.3 FM The Message Radio. Uh, the Message Radio is a Christian radio station and what we do is we program 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, praise and worship music. Uh, we've been on the air now about eight years and the idea behind the station when we started it was what type of Christian music is not being heard in Sheboygan County and we actually drove around and looked at church marquees, those are signs out in front of churches, and found that many churches were offering now contemporary services in Sheboygan County. And by contemporary services, they simply mean praise and worship music. So that's what WSTM is, 91.3 FM. It's all praise and worship music and some good biblical teaching programs during the day. And also we have a translator station in, Wisconsin, in uh, Sheboygan, which is 103.3. So for those people that can't hear 91.3 in Sheboygan, they can listen to us at 103.3. We also own under the corporate head of Jubilation Ministries, 1420 AM The Breeze. That was our original acquisition uh, back in uh, the early 1990s. Uh, we acquired, uh, we bought the existing WPLY and it then became WJUB. It was originally our Christian station, but then when we acquired our FM, we converted what was WJUB, 1420 AM. We converted that into a station that is now called The Breeze. It plays the great American standards music, which is, of course, Frank Sinatra, Tony Bennett, and uh, Nat King Cole, and some of the more current artists like uh, Michael Buble and, and so on and so forth. My radio career actually got started in college, and uh, after college I came to Sheboygan to teach at Sheboygan North High School. I actually started at South High School and then was transferred over to North High School where I became the advisor for WSHS Radio, the high school radio station. I served as their advisor for well over 20 years and worked with the students there. Uh, teaching the broadcasting classes, uh, teaching them what it meant to become a good broadcaster, doing sports talk shows and uh, the music programming and doing live broadcasts of the radio, uh, basketball and football games and things of that nature. Uh, so I taught at Sheboygan North High School for almost 30 years, was the advisor of the radio station all the time I was there, and then uh, at that point started Jubilation Ministries and started uh, 1420 AM The Breeze and 91.3 FM The Message and that's where I am today. And the picture behind me is a picture of Susie Nordyke and Susie is the operations director for 91.3 FM The Message. It is her responsibility to keep that station going on a on a day-to-day -day basis and she's been with us uh, since the very beginning and uh, she's also the afternoon voice on 1420 AM The Breeze so she wears two hats as well. Hi, I'm Tom Lang, and I'm currently doing the contract uh, engineering for WSHS FM 91.7. Uh, I've got started in electronics as a boy, where I would build a small electronic pro uh, pieces, and uh, I was heavily influenced by my neighbor at the time, Chris Bauer. So that's how I got my start in electronics. I then went to uh, went through high school, went to uh, Lakeshore Technical Institute. After that, got a two-year associate degree in electronics technology. Um, eventually, a few years after that, I got involved with one of the local broadcast stations as a, a fill-in broadcast engineer. That was, uh, at the time, WKTS 950. And then after that, uh, Chris Bauer had also expressed some interest in having me fill in for him at uh, WHBL uh, when he was on vacation. Um, in order to do these things, of course, you had to have a first-class FCC radio telephone license, which I got uh, in the mid-70s, so I was able to do these things. And as time went on, um, after a while, when now this is going ahead in time a number of years, when WSHS uh, came on the air, it was taken one, one definite uh, key figure in that uh, acquisition of WSHS or the building of it was Charlie Mace here, um, which would be, you know, he'll have some things to say as well. Obviously, he's the key player in, in the radio station. But um, a few years, a number of years after that, um, I was contacted as to do the electronics work at WSHS on a contractual basis. 
So that was, I believe, in the late 80s at the time they went through, they were going through a power increase and other facilities upgrades. So then I, I maintained that station on a contractual basis. Shortly after that, I, there was a position opened in the electronics department at the Sheboygan Area School District. So I applied for that and, and, and got that. And Charlie can tell you how that came about. But of course, once I was on the staff, one of my duties was maintaining the uh, technical operations of WSHS. Um, about a year ago, I retired from the district. And once again, I'm doing the just the uh, radio transmission equipment, the, what would be known as the RF side of it for WSHS on a contractual basis. And so that's about it. And um, time to time, it requires designing special circuits because there's just nothing available commercially. And I think anybody in broadcast engineering will tell you that. So I've been able to do that, which is kind of fun to be able to design circuits and implement them and have them work. So. My name is Charlie Mace. I was actually involved in the original inception of the radio station way back in the early 70s. Uh, as seen in that poster over there, the, the idea of the radio station began in, in 1971, and that's actually when I graduated from high school. Um, the idea was, was developed. I worked part-time at that time for the school district uh, summers and while I was going to technical school. And after I completed technical school, the district had a full-time open. Uh, and at that time, we were in the process of, the radio station was actually up and running, and I had worked with an individual called Wally Primazek in developing the station. So we were actually uh, the leaders in, in actually getting FM radio in Sheboygan, actually in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, how that incur occurred is we visited a radio station in Illinois. Uh, was in southern Chicago, an FM, educational FM station. Um, the unique, I don't remember much about the trip. The only thing I remember was a very influential school district. Uh, the kids all came to school in limos. So we were kind of impacted and we showed up in this little uh, van one, one, after, one morning and uh, decided to see what their radio station consisted of. And I, basically their operation was donated by, by uh, corporations in the Chicago area and that's how they got FM, educational FM radio going. Uh, we looked at their basic model and that's how we developed our station. Uh, we decided we had to go out and secure money so we took out a loan. Uh, it was a, the parent organization actually funded the radio station for a number of years. Um, and as it grew and developed, we eventually turned it over to the school district. Um, I said I, I began with the school district and actually in 72. Uh, I'm in my 40th year with the district, so I've been involved in all the physical construction and, and op some of the operational pieces of the upper radio station through that time period. Hi, I'm Steve Gallimore, and I'm here with my mom, Mary Gallimore, at the presentation for the radio program and we're here just exhibiting a short little exhibit but one from the 30s and 40s. Mom, could you tell us what, uh, what you're here? Okay. Uh, my father was uh, an actor and about uh, with the community players as it was called then back in the late 30s and early 40s and uh, they um, I don't know how it happened, but they put on some of their programs, Sherlock Holmes mainly, on WHBL. And so I thought this was kind of important, and uh, my son found these articles, uh, and, uh, which are behind me. <laughs> and uh, my father's name was Art Quast, and, uh, well. And who did he play? Who did he play in the program? Let's see, Sherlock. Uh, Watson, Dr. Watson. <laughs> I'd forgotten, yeah. Dr. Watson. And uh, the fellas, uh, I don't know how many years they did this, but uh, a fellow by the name of Al Chop, who is still living to this day, uh, did all the writing of the scripts and things for this program. He, he currently is in the retirement home over here. And, uh, but my father, uh, basically died very young. Uh, he died, what, in four, 40, yeah. So he was in this from about 38, 39 until he died in 42, and he was 41. <laughs> but he was a heavy set man, and he 
very jovial, and uh, I guess the, the fellows had a real good time doing this, you know, uh, as long as they did. Uh, it was. Yes, right. The, it was called Community Players for many years. Uh -huh. The 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 uh, theater group now that was changed more in recent years. The, the, name the name was changed, but it's the same type of thing. WHBL was uh, at that time in the uh, building on Seventh Street, the Seventh and Center or something, uh, where the Sheboygan Press Building is. So the the uh, radio station was upstairs, and they did their broadcasts. Uh, from there, so did they I, make sound effects and like that? I'm sure they probably did. Yes, definitely. Uh, Al Chop, as I say, he was he wrote the scripts for these shows, and uh, so they um, they followed that. Well, you also did some digging to try to get some more information. Oh yes, I tried to get information through the the uh, radio station. They had no archives uh, except for some. Uh, uh, Articles that were on the wall, but Bob already was had asked for those, but they weren't anything like this specific. And then I I, ch I went to the I went to the uh, press building, so I got up. They said go upstairs on the second floor, and all they have really is um, uh, the same articles, you know, in, in all the newspapers. But it was there weren't any pictures. That that's what's surprising. I we couldn't find any. Recordings now. Somebody might have some recordings. Uh, I, I checked with uh, Al Chop's family, his daughter. She looked among some archives that she has. Uh, but somebody, I think, may have some some family. Uh, I'm going to check with. I just discovered another of the family of one of the actors might have something. You know, I might I might be able to. Yeah, yeah, because it seems to me they're worth it. <laughs> I just think it, it uh, it's it's pretty significant. I think it's it. I wish we had more to show for for this period of time, you know, for this event. So it's fun. I I mean, it's fun bringing it all up again. This display is about Don McNeil, and Don McNeil grew up in the Sheboygan area. I think he moved, his family moved here when he was about three years old. But later in his life, he moved to Chicago, went to Chicago and started a radio program there, the Don McNeil Breakfast Club. It was an incredibly popular show. Every morning during the week, it came on the air, it had some music, it had uh, Don McNeil, of course, but had Aunt Fanny, had a whole bunch of other characters which were part of the show. And they were on the air for, from 1933 to 1968. It is uh, also a well-known fact that this radio program, this variety show, this talk show of sorts, uh, was a leader in the industry in terms of this kind of programming. Sometimes they took the show on the road, they went all around the country and on the one sh uh, big picture here talks about they came back to Sheboygan in 1945 and did a show here in Sheboygan as well. Like I say, they traveled all over the country uh, to do the uh, Breakfast Club shows. There were Breakfast Club fans, there were Breakfast Club clubs all around the, the country as well. And there was a point in his tenure with the Breakfast Club that uh, mostly for fun, he was running for president as well. So you'll see perhaps some of the pictures about that adventure too. This station is to represent a, um, like a radio station um, in uh, the Sheboygan County area so we can replicate and show people how, uh, make it feel like they are on the air as well, especially for um, kids of all ages um, so they can um, reenact kind of what it's like to be uh, on the radio. So what we're going to do is we're going to play, um, I'll read a short segment, we'll record it on, on the tape player um, and then play it back um, so that they can hear themselves uh, on the radio. Let's face it, there's not many lonely appliance repairmen out there. The truth of the matter is, appliances do break down. And when your appliances need an overhaul, Mike's Appliance Repair of Plymouth is the place to call providing professional service on all major brands of kitchen and laundry appliances, gas and electric, serving all of Sheboygan County since 1985. 
Mike's Appliance Repair of Plymouth. Mike may not be a lonely repairman, but he'll always make time for you. And then we just rewind it back. And we play it so that they can hear themselves uh, kind of on the radio. The appliance repairman out there. The truth of the matter is, appliances do break down. And when your appliances need an overhaul, Mike's Appliance Repair of Plymouth is the place to call. Providing professional service on all major brands of kitchen and laundry appliances, gas and electric, serving all of Sheboygan County since 1985. Mike's Appliance Repair of Plymouth. Mike may not be a lonely repairman, but he'll always make time for you. Hi, my name is Nanette Bulabash. I'm here at the museum talking about my radio days. Uh, my radio career began when I was in college. Uh, Lakeland College in Sheboygan, I started attending. My friends were all involved in something called WVLC, which was the voice of Lakeland College. And it wasn't hard to get involved, and before I knew it, I was spinning records back when they had 45s. So I, did, I was the DJ, and that was so much fun because I grew up listening to the DJs on WLS and, and all the Chicago stations where I grew up. And of course, AM radio back then played top 40 music. So that was fun. And then um, I found out about a, a news job because I was interested in journalism. I was taking journalism courses at Lakeland. And I found out that WHBL in Sheboygan was looking for a news reporter. So I went over there for an interview. Uh, the head of the news department then was a man by the name of Ted Charles, which I found out later wasn't his real name, but it was a perfect radio name. He met me. He said, yeah, you'll do. You can be a stringer. I'll just um, hire you for part-time stories. But Nanette Bullabash, that'll never do. No, no, no. Let's, let's give you a new name. How about Gene Williams? Yeah, Gene Williams. That's a good name. People will remember it. So from then on, I was Gene Williams. Um, I remember those first stories. I was very nervous. I had a microphone, of course, and an old tape recorder. We did everything on cassette, and then we transferred it to reel to reel in uh, at the state at the studio. So I would I would go and interview people with my either mini recorder or this big lunky thing with the handle. And I would put my microphone up to ask whatever questions. One of the first stories I remember was Lee Dreyfus. I don't know if you remember, but he was um, running for governor then. He had been a chancellor at UW Stevens Point, I want to say, um, and he was running for governor. He was he was touring the state of Wisconsin. I bet this would have been 1976 or 1980, probably 76. Um, and he was 75 when he was still running. He's touring the state with this, this group of college kids. Of course, he was from UW Stevens Point, so college kids and like this big bus, of, but it had an open top. So these college kids with their instruments are playing music. He's down, he's interviewing people. He knew, he could tell I was a reporter because of my equipment. So I go to answer him some questions and I'm this young, innocent reporter. Um, uh, Candidate, Mr. Dreyfus, um, tell me about yourself. Uh, why should we vote for you? And I'm real nervous. He, of course, was the consummate professional. He's, he looked at my microphone and he, he grabbed it with my hand, still holding it, and held it up right close to his mouth, which is what you have to do. Otherwise, you're not going to get good audio. And so I'm like holding it with him holding it next to his mouth, and that's how he did the whole interview. Him holding my mic and um, so he could get good audio. Then I went back to the station, and of course, Ted Charles was thrilled because we got a great great um, audio version of his voice I don't I don't think my questions were very good but over time they got better later on I did the police beat um, sheriff department you, you went in the morning to all the different places to find out what happened overnight if there was a fire you'd stop at the at the fire station full-time fire department but they didn't have many fires it always smelled good at the fire station because they were great cooks I think they still are and you went to the police speed. I was usually the only woman reporter among the, the crew. We all met together. I put up with a lot of what would be called sexual harassment now. Um, I was too young and naive to know that I even had a right to question that. I just put up with it. I think most people in those times did. Even covering city council. I covered Plymouth City Council, Sheboygan City Council, school board meetings, county board, all that. Even those people, they were almost all men. They, they, um, 
yeah, they, you know, oh, Blondie, or what do you got? Uh, oh, just what, what's under that microphone? And just horrible stuff, horrible stuff that I would not tolerate now, but back then I did. And I bet early radio women in those times and in any kind of uh, journalism, sports reporters now, they, they still put up with it, but now we're smarter. We know how to speak up. But those were tough times. Most of the, my radio memories are very, very happy. The pay was awful, 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 at least for reporters. I think I was news director of WHBL. I was making $5 an hour. And this was, you know, I had a college degree, but I did it. I, because I love radio. I loved it. I went on to do other things, newspaper reporting. I'm a librarian now. But I miss those radio days. I would do it again in a heartbeat, even for $5 an hour or less, just because it was a lot of fun. And if you listen to the other people today and talk about and hear their memories, um, they all are full of wonderful stories. Hi, I'm Dick Romaine. I'm from the 1960s era at uh, WHBL in Sheboygan. From 64 to 70, I worked in the news department where we did the morning newscasts, and I worked with Ralph Norman, who was the uh, morning announcer at that time. And one of my colleagues was Dick Helhake. Dick Helhake uh, was not the name, however, that I used on the air. When I was broadcasting on WHBL, I used the name uh, Dick Rulo and uh, started at WHBL in uh, 1957 and worked there till uh, 65. So uh, I had the good fortune of working with Dick Romaine for, uh, for over a year. We were talking before Dick and I about uh, what we call it the golden age of radio before it became all talk and uh, there were actual personalities on the radio and we had several outstanding uh, personalities at our, at our station and of course uh, Julian Yetzer was uh, one of the engineers and kind of kept that station going on the air but it was a, it was a great time to be in radio. Well, it, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, the golden age. I think it was the golden age for, for local radio stations, and WHBL was really quite exceptional. Paul Skinner, who uh, bought the station from uh, Broughton, Charles Broughton bought, uh, was the owner, and uh, Paul came from WTMJ with a, a great radio background, and he set very high standards for WHBL. Uh, in his announcing staff and in, in, uh, in his, his new staff. We were probably the only small market station that had three full-time newsmen. And that, that was really quite, quite unusual that a, a small local station would put that amount of emphasis on uh, news broadcasting. And uh, several of the people that uh, worked at the station went on to greater things. Uh, Bob Wittes, who was the news director, that was just prior to you coming on, yeah. I think, uh, Dick. Bob Wittes went on to uh, the uh, uh, Journal Sentinel and became the uh, editorial editor of, uh, of the uh, Milwaukee Sentinel. And John Grams, of course, who was uh, one of the announcers on the station, went on and uh, got his doctor's degree in radio broadcasting and uh, became a uh, a doctor of uh, broadcast history and taught at Marquette University. So we had a rather remarkable uh, group group of uh, people. Uh, anything else that comes to your mind? Uh, well, uh, a couple other names. Bill Dwyer, uh, I don't know if yeah. anybody recalls that name anymore, but he started out at HPL and he later became the sports editor. I believe it was the Los Angeles Times. So there were qu quite a few people and, and Joe Gulig, of course, was in uh, the news department when I was there he came on as a part-time person and is still with the Sheboygan Press so there were a lot of a lot of great people that were on the staff at the time so I, I consider it a great opportunity to be able to say that I worked in radio for about 10 years and HPL was kind of the highlight of my career. Well, I, uh, I started in radio in, in the uh, very early 50s, right after getting out of uh, the Army, and uh, worked uh, in, in Wausau, worked in uh, 
Fort Madison, Iowa, w, uh, or KXGI, and uh, then a station in uh, Illinois before coming to WHBL. And uh, really, uh, it, it was an impressive change to come to a station such as Paul Skinner was was running at the time. We had a great deal of freedom, the announcers, in the music that we chose and in putting our shows together so that each show sort of reflected the personality of the individual announcer. My show was different than uh, Ralph Norman's or Julian Yetzer's or John Graham's. We, we all had unique shows and personalities and within the program guidelines that Paul Skinner had set, we had a great deal of freedom in uh, presenting our, our music. So it was a good time and uh, I, I left radio to uh, find greener pastures uh, in, uh, in the world of business, but uh, I can say that they were uh, some of the most enjoyable memories that I have and uh, over the years have made and kept some very dear friends. Well, for me, uh WHBL was a stepping stone to another career in, in public information. I left the station in about 1970 to work for Lakeshore Technical College. At that time, it was uh, had another name at that time, but uh, later became Lakeshore Tech. And it just happens my the boss who hired me was just by the table here, Fred Nirodi. So that was the start of a new career for me. Hi, I'm Kevin Zimmerman, and I've been with WHBL since 1976. I got my start as a part-time announcer there, uh, working weekends, and within about a half a year, was offered a job to take over for Frank Wright, who was leaving our station. So I said, sure, I'll do that. Uh, my very first full-time day on the air was a program we used to do live every first Wednesday of the month at Wisconsin Power and Light Company. They had a theater downtown. And it was a cooking demonstration with Irene Burbach, and I would moderate that. So my very first full-time day, I lasted 15 minutes before laryngita seized my voice, and I had to <laughs> sort of... Uh, I, I made it through the rest of that, uh, but after that, it's a, an auspicious start, but uh, since then, I uh, took over the morning drive, uh, which is the sign-on duties, uh, a few years later, and continued that until 2001. Uh, back then, uh, and we went through a number of different changes. Mike Walton, who's over my shoulder there, had purchased the station in 1972, and uh, owned that till the mid 80s uh, when it was sold to a group called Central States Broadcasting out of Chicago. They owned us for a couple of years and then Mike Walton bought the operation back. Uh, and he eventually sold that to uh, Duke Wright, which is an operator. Uh, uh, Duke Wright is out of Wausau and owns a group of uh, over 40 stations located throughout the Midwest, so we're a member of that group right now. Uh, back in 2001, I, uh, when Duke bought the station, I was offered a position which is called Creative Services Director, so my duties right now are to write and produce and schedule the commercials for our four stations, WHBL, and our FM stations, which are WBFM, WXCR, and WHBZ. So uh, my day right now is uh, mostly spent behind a computer doing audio productions, a far cry from the days, and uh, I don't think too many people still do radio like it was back in the day, where you would be a person behind the microphone and uh, you'd have a telephone, a couple of record turntables, a couple of tape playback machines, and basically you were responsible for every second of the day. That's why I said in a, a little article I wrote for the event today that uh, during those times, if you asked me what I was doing on a Wednesday at 9.45 in the morning, I could tell you exactly what I was doing because I had to know. <laughs> and there was no second uncovered. Uh, it, it makes for a rather quick day and uh, a very interesting day. Radio was always one of the best jobs I can imagine having for information because the news of the world would come through there. It was your job to uh, get it from the sources and uh, pass it along to the listeners. Uh, it could have been something as mundane as uh, there was a wreck on a street corner and that would be closed off for a while, or it could be big events uh, when I was on the air, things like uh, the Polk being shot, Ronald Reagan getting shot, the hostage taking in Iran, uh, Mount St. Helens erupting, 
huge, uh, the, the space shuttle, uh, uh, Columbia, all, all these events you can recall having been behind the microphone when the uh, word got out, there's a big event, we're going to be covering this now. And so everything from the uh, mundane to the spectacular would uh, come through. And as a result uh, of the repetition, it would stick in the mind. Uh, there was a program I did for many years called Party Line, which is sort of like a domestic information program. People would call up with a question, and if I didn't have the answer, uh, we'd get the answer from somebody. And I made an assembly of teeny little notes that I kept in a note box. Eventually, I could go through alphabetically, recall that, and pull out my little teeny slip of paper that had the solution to the problem on. So I did that for many years, and it became second nature. Uh, radio isn't the same a anymore. Nobody does quite that sort of uh, long sequence of programs of a variety like we had back then. Everything now is much more specialized. There's a lot more syndication. So the business has changed quite a bit. I've been fortunate to have spent what I consider uh, much of the heyday of radio, of, of those programs, the interactive, the local, where you had a lot of people uh, to talk to and uh, deal with. Uh, during maybe the best years of that. I enjoyed that very much. And now that I'm writing and producing the commercials, my time pressure isn't quite the same. I don't have to have something ready every second of the day. But boy, I've sure got to have the product ready for the next day. So it's still a very uh, stimulating and interesting business. I'm Margaret Goldman. My mother was Ludmilla Sheck. They called her Milla. And she sang, had a program on WHBL when I was small, it was the early 1930s. I don't have a date, but I know that uh, the man who became my stepfather and I would walk down to the press station because the studio was above the, WHBL was above the press. And we would walk down and wait for my mother's program to be done and she'd come down the stairs and we'd go home. And I, once in a while, we could listen to her on the radio. But she used to sing uh, some of the newer songs. She had worked at the Fisher City News Depot on North 8th Street, where part of the Nemshoff building now stands. And she worked there, and when new sheet music came in, she would play it and sing it, so that when customers came in and wanted to know what the music sounded like, she would do that. Well, then Mr. Fisher got her into singing and going to the WHBL to put on about a 15-minute program. And so she would take some of this newer music and play it and sing it so that people could, uh, you know, could hear what it sounded like. And she did this for a number of years, and she signed off every program by singing Good Night, Sweetheart which was made famous by Rudy Valley back in the 1930s. I still have the sheet music, so it is interesting, but I had to come and see what things were like. So how long she sang, for how many years or all, I have no way of knowing, because as a little child, who was interested in all of this stuff? So I never asked them. But I had to come down here today just to kind of reminisce and remembering that she did sing on WHBL.